Hello and welcome to this review of my IBM 4978 keyboard. This is a really rare and special keyboard that I'm both proud and excited to be able to show you this week. I bought this keyboard off of eBay recently. It was by far the most expensive keyboard I've ever bought. But hey, is she a beaut or what? The 4978 is an instantly recognizable, extremely rare model of Beamspring keyboard, kind of in the style of an IBM battleship. And in fact, it has the same number of keys, 122, which is why I proposed the name Beamship when someone finally presented one of these on Desk Authority a few years ago. I mean, it's a beam spring battleship. What more could you possibly want in a keyboard? The IBM 4978 Display Station was a terminal computer, part of the IBM Series 1 line of systems, which was released in 1976. There were quite a few different models and accessories for it, each one cryptically numbered as per IBM's usual practice. Because of this modular approach, it could be configured for a wide range of applications, and it was adopted by companies ranging from Kmart and General Motors to the United States Marine Corps. Famously, a few years ago, it was reported that the entire US nuclear arsenal ran on an IBM Series 1 computers, which they were planning to finally replace in 2019. Costs of the system obviously varied depending on what you bought, but apparently a single display station unit with printer and input-output expansion card was about $50,000 at the time, which is roughly 200 grand adjusted for inflation. Yeah, computers back in those days cost practically their weight in gold, hence why they could afford to build such good keyboards for them. The 4978 used with IBM referred to as Keyboard B. It was later replaced by Keyboard F, which is known in the community as the Model F because it is labelled as such in some parts, and later Keyboard M, which is now known as the famous Model M. Although from what I've seen, IBM themselves didn't really use the term Model X to refer to types of keyboard. Regardless, using the modern nomenclature, I guess you could call a Beamspring keyboard a Model B. The beam spring switches in keyboard B were the predecessors of the more well-known buckling spring switch designs used in keyboards F and M. The redesign from beam to buckling spring was done for several reasons, mainly height, as the beam spring mechanism was exceptionally tall, but it also reduced the amount of parts per switch dramatically, which made manufacturing them a lot easier. Some people have wondered what the individual letters B, F and M stand for, but they really just appear to be chronological indexes. There was also a keyboard A, which was based on microswitch SW Hall effect switches used on some of their oldest models, such as the 3277. There were doubtlessly other types as well. This issue of IBM Sightline, for example, also references a keyboard E, which appears to be one of the taller designs. I assume the other letters were simply designs that didn't make it past prototyping. In terms of actual dimensions, it's roughly the same size as a conventional Battleship Model F actually, except with, as IBM called it, a pounds thinner look. It's slightly less wide, but a bit deeper and much taller, 10.5 centimeters, which is taller than my fist, look at this. It's also more than half again as heavy at 6.8 kilos compared to 4 for the battleship, or all of those things in imperial measurement units, 4 shillings and sixpence. 6.8 kilos is in fact slightly heavier than 3 Model M keyboards, so it's impressive to say the least, the second heaviest keyboard in my collection at the moment. The styling is similar to that of the 5251, which I've reviewed before, except this one is bigger and much heavier. IBM did several other series as well, such as the 3270s, but they looked rather different. The 4978 is the second biggest beam spring keyboard I know of, after the Beam Hemoth, although that one is even rarer as far as I can tell. Pretty much keyboard unobtainium, like that Bertold I've been stalking for years. The unit is built as follows, the top cover is painted plastic, 7mm thick, with brass screw sockets, and the assembly is all steel, 1.5mm thick, which in turn is bolted to the chassis, which is also steel, 1.6mm. Just for comparison's sake, the steel housing on a Kalashnikov assault rifle is only 1mm steel, so <laughs> this is really no joke. 
It's rather hard to get the assembly off actually because the bolts are placed in very inaccessible locations so I'll probably need to fuck around with some special tools to take it off and putting it back on seems near impossible. But geez, what a fucking unit! Regardless, as you can see, it is extraordinarily clean and in fantastic condition. I can hardly believe it, it's immaculate, there's hardly a mark on the thing. I did remove the original contamination shield, which is a plastic sheet that is draped over the chassis to keep it clean. However, these invariably just fall apart over time. You'll also note the presence of these vestigial switch holes that were covered up with some kind of fibre tape. It seems the plate was intended for a number of different configurations. It uses a capacitive sensing PCB which has a removable bus on it, just like the 5251, except it's twice as long. Or rather, it's two buses right next to each other. This means that it's not just plug and play compatible with X Watsit's beam spring controllers, although it is possible that this will be developed at some point. I can't wait to use this bad boy. The controller PCB is also absolutely giant by the way, at 43 centimeters long, nearly the length of a whole Model M. For comparison, here's the original PCB of my other beam spring keyboard, the 5251, which is already a massive piece of work, and here's one from a Model F. Big boy, yeah. It doesn't have a built-in solenoid though. Many beam springs had a solenoid that jackhammered against the pan when you pressed a key, which sounds like this. Because X Watsit actually engineered solenoid compatibility into his controllers, including a separate solenoid board for it, I think it should be compatible with a retrofitted solenoid. Oh yeah! And finally, there's the cable, which is rather short, but so thick, a full 10 millimeters, that is very unflexible and actually kind of awkward to handle. It's clipped to the controller via this thing here, and it's held to the case with this screwed on plate hook, and it terminates in a 25 pin connector that I'll show you here. One of the pins looks like it's not in use. The back of the keyboard has a sticker on it, although it's not really the same style as the later Model M keyboards. It doesn't show a manufacture date on it, just a part number, 4412501, and a bunch of other things that I'm not sure what they mean. Like my other beam spring keyboard, the cable has a cloth tag on it which does list the manufacture date, which was midway 1979, 8 years older than I am, holy shit. The keycaps are massive, thick, double shot ABS, 2mm, with a curious mount that I'd strongly advise to take off using only vertical back and forth motion. Curiously, for ABS, they're not in the slightest bit yellowed, and I've seen this on other beam springs too, they remain pristine for some reason. Maybe it didn't have those BFRs in it yet that caused yellowing upon UV exposure. Or, <laughs> who knows, maybe it's not even ABS at all. They have a nice grainy texture, centered, large lettering, and deep spherical key tops. The homing keys, FJ and numpad 4, 5, and 6, didn't use homing bumps, but instead, as was common at the time, even deeper dishes. I measured it with some calipers, and it's about 1.7 millimeters deep, which is quite a lot. I think these caps are really beautiful, to be honest. One of the most recognizable features of this model of keyboard is the re-legendable keys at the top. The Beam Hemoth also had re-legendables, but they looked quite different. I don't think I've ever seen any other model of keyboard come with these. Unlike most re-legendable covers, they are slide out using two dovetail rails. They're a faint yellow color with curiously matte tops, but you can see through them without difficulty. These top keys were programmable function keys, which, according to one article I read, was found to be very impressive, and the re-legendable fronts meant that you could put a piece of paper behind them to remind you of what you had programmed into them. It's a little bit like what later battleships would do too, although those just said PF and sometimes a default function on them. Some of the bigger keys, like this Enter key here, don't use wire stabilizers like they would on later IBM keyboards, but use two switches instead, with one of them a dummy switch which doesn't click. It works quite well, although it does make these switches a bit stiffer than the rest. The spacebar uses a good old wire stabilizer though. 
The layout is fairly bizarre and will raise some eyebrows, I'm sure. There's this weird blank but not re-legendable keycap near the top left here, and there's one extra column in the alphanumeric block to both the left and the right, which makes reaching some keys, like the right shift, rather hard. It's got line and field duplicate keys, two front tabs and two back tabs, two rep keys, which I'm not 100% sure what they do, but I'm guessing they engage the typematic, which is what repeats keys that you keep pressed down, and two enter keys, as well as a separate carriage return key. Back then, return and enter didn't do the same thing, like they almost always do nowadays. Enter was for executing commands, while return simply put your cursor on the next line. Anyway, it's got a simple numpad with a double O key on it, a block nav to the left of it, this was several years before DEC and IBM would popularize the inverted T nav we now use, and a delete but no backspace key, one of the enter keys occupies that space instead. Overall, it's pretty weird if you stare at it for a while, but on the other hand, it's actually relatively modern, and with some key rebinding, the layout might not end up all that hostile, I think, particularly as these keys are all uniprofile, so you can move the keycaps around a bit. And finally, the switches, which is of course the real meat and potatoes. These are very curious looking specimens, which I did a teardown video on ages ago, go and have a look if you're interested. Instead of the buckling springs of their successors, these are driven by beam-shaped plate springs, hence the name, and this gives them a quite different feel and sound. As it happens, every single one of the switches still clicks, with the exception of this one in the corner. I suspect that one of the fly spring interlock hooks came off. If I haven't opened the unit's assembly, I can probably fix it. Beam springs are lighter than both membrane and capacitive buckling springs, and they have a small, sharp, delicate tactile bump to it, which is inherently matched up with the click sound. They are ridiculously smooth, so much so that they almost feel free-floating. Blue Alps may be my favorite switches historically, but Beam Springs are easily the best feeling switches I've ever tried, no question about it. And not just the best clicky ones too, just best in general. It's just 100% pure blister type on these, rather steep keyboard angle and weird layout notwithstanding. Also, they're of course capacitive, so they have inherent N key rollover. Yeah, see, ultimate gaming keyboard right there. A few random ones use a different horizontal mounting pin rather than the standard slanted one, but they still work. I'm really not sure how these came to be here, but I think they're repair units, either directly from IBM themselves or made by someone who had a lot of patience. They fit like a glove, but require you to manually align the angle and the keycap with that of the others. Normally, they come with little plastic bag thingies over them to protect them from dirt and dust, but they kind of fall apart over time, so I removed them on mine. Well, at least they did their job well in the meantime. Overall, this beast is a fantastic addition to my collection. What a sublime piece of keyboard history. Hopefully, I can get it converted and briefly show it to you in working order, because it's quite simply excellent. That's it for this review. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed it and following is a typing demonstration of me typing on this keyboard.